If you've got your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of John, chapter 6. We'll pick it up in verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And then a great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs, which he had performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. And then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have even a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here with five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000, and Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise to the fish, as much as they wanted. Okay, put your finger in that part, and come with me to the book of Exodus. I'm not sure I don't lose my place, I have all read it. Um, <clears throat> Exodus chapter 25. Verse 23, and I'm just going to skip along for much of this here. You shall also make a table of acacia wood. Two cubits shall be its length, a cubit its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold, and make a molding of gold all around. You shall make for it a frame of a hand's breadth all around, and you shall make a gold molding for the frame all around. And you shall make for it four rings of gold, and put the rings in the four corners that are on its legs. The rings shall be close to the frame as holders for the poles to, be, uh, to bear the table. And you shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold that the table may be carried with them. You shall make its dishes, its pans, its pitchers, and its bowls for pouring. You shall make them of pure gold. And finally, you don't have to turn to this, I'll just quote it for you. John chapter 18, verse 38. Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? What we have here are three problems. We have, for example, Jesus looking at these thousands of people descending upon them and saying to the disciples, how are we going to feed these people? We have the Israelites in the wilderness getting these very explicit instructions for how to make a tabernacle, and they're required to use pure gold. Not gold leaf, not gold paint, not a little filigree thing, but gold, lots of it, and pure gold. And they're in the wilderness. So no one can exactly run off to Tabernacle Depot and pick up some gold for this. Where are they going to get the gold? A good question. And then we have Pilate who's got a bit of a problem. He is under intense pressure from the Jewish leaders to execute this man because he says he's the son of God. Now, to the Jews, that's blasphemy unto death. I get that. To Pilate, the Roman general, who has been raised with all these Roman myths as part of his religious upbringing, this is a problem because the Roman myths are filled with tales of the gods whose idea of fun was to take human form and go and walk amongst people and mess with their minds. So now here he comes face to face with this man, Jesus of Nazareth, who may not exactly look like his idea of Jupiter or Mercury or whatever, but you never know. So now he's, he's just a little bit worried. I mean, he got, he got up that morning, he thought he knew everything. He was a Roman general, he was consul of Judea. He goes out there. And by this time, he is confused. And so when he says, what is truth? I don't think he's challenging Jesus. I don't think it's a rhetorical question. He is at a point now where he is going, what is truth? Three problems. Now, another way of describing a problem is a situation. Situation is a nice, neutral term. You can have a situation that is advantageous, and we call that a benefit, we call that a blessing. Uh, you can have a situation that's adverse, and we call that a problem. Situation is kind of, 
You see, that the difference between the two of them is where you happen to have your perspective at that time. You can know something that happens to you, and oh, shoot, it's a problem, and then later on we say, well, you know, that was a blessing in disguise. Okay, we say that. We also have situations where we think, oh, wow, have I ever nailed this one? I made the right decision. And it's blown up in your face a week later. Then you go, hmm, maybe this is a good idea after all. Who, who, whose idea was that? Oh, yeah, it was mine. So that's, that's the difference. And that's why it's a good way to look at a situation as opposed to a problem or an advantage. Of course, something else we can remember in a case like this is that any situation is a manifestation for God's revelation. Say that with me, just to see if you're awake. Any situation is a manifestation for God's revelation. Because when we take a look at a situation, we say, okay, God, where are you in this? Suddenly things start to fall together. They start to come together for us, and we start to look at things a whole different way. And if it's something that looked like a, like a problem at first, well, then we start to learn something. We start to see why that problem got sent to us. So how do you get from situation to revelation? Well, let's look at the loaves and fishes thing. I know fishes is poor grammar, but that's the way I was raised in King James. So loaves and fishes it is, so excuse me. Um, let's look at the loaves and fish. What did Jesus do that unlocked that blessing, that got things rolling? Well, if you look at John's Gospel, what is it that stuck out in his mind more than anything else? You know, as a, as a feeding upwards of 7,000 people, because there was 5,000 men plus women and children, as a feeding 7,000 people with very little wasn't impressive enough. What is it that stuck out in his mind? Remember, John was writing this 50 years after the fact, thereabouts. He was quite an old man when he wrote this gospel, and he was writing it as a personal memoir sort of thing. Well, have a look in John 6. Should I get my finger in this? <laughs> have a look at John 6, verse 23. He says, other boats came from Tiberias, near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. Not after the Lord had performed a miracle, not after he had dished it all out to all these thousands of people from a seemingly small supply, but after the Lord had given thanks. That is the key that unlocks this blessing from God and moves you from situation to revelation. It is giving thanks. It is humbling yourself to say, Lord, thank you that you're in charge. Thank you that you've got this supply thing all in hand. Thank you that I don't have to worry about it. And whatever it happens to be, God's got it covered. And we say thank you. We're saying thank you before the fact. Sometimes I think we ought to have Thanksgiving in March or April, seeding time. We're even thanking for the harvest to come, as opposed to waiting until it's already coming. Oh yeah, good harvest. Okay, thanks, Lord. Last year, not a ton, good harvest. Yeah, keep it. You know, no, we want to give thanks to God before, even while we're in the midst of the problem. Give thanks to God for coming up with a solution. And actually, the fact of the matter is, God already has the solution. Have a look. Let's go back to uh, let's go back to the wilderness those instructions for building the tabernacle. Where did they get the gold for that? Well, rewind a few chapters in the book of Exodus. We're back in Egypt, and God instructed his people to go to their Egyptian neighbors and say, give us all your gold and silver and precious, the precious stones. Now, that may sound kind of weird, but if you've got the Israelites going to the Egyptians, the Egyptians would probably say at that point, Wait a minute, your God told you to say that? Well, look, if this is going to get rid of the famine, if it's going to get rid of the floods, the frogs, the blood in the river, all of that stuff, here, take it, take it, take it. So that's how they get it. The Israelites, on the other hand, they're not thinking tabernacle at that point. They're thinking, well, when we get to the promised land, we're going to need to pick up a few things, so it'll be good to have some gold. God's got something else in mind. God didn't just, you know, wake up Moses one morning and say, you know, I've been thinking I got this great idea. Why don't you build me a tabernacle and uh, use some gold in that? Nah. God was thinking tabernacle even before the Israelites went into Egypt because he knows the beginning from the end. Amen? So he's got that idea going. He already had the solution in mind. 
The problem was later to come. So this is the thing that happens. God provides the solution, and then he says, stand by for the problem. So when you're faced with the problem, the adverse situation, one of the things you give thanks to God for is that he's already provided the solution. And when you give thanks to him, then he reveals it. Consider Abraham. He takes his son Isaac up the mountain. He's been told to sacrifice his son to God. Or at least offer him as bird sacrifice. And I think the semantics there is quite important. Offer him as a, as a sacrifice to God. And Abraham gets up to the top and he's got the wood laid out. He's all set to set fire to it all. He's got the kid laid out on the altar. He's got the knife in his hand. He's all about to plunge it into the kid's chest. The angel comes down to stop. Look over there. And there's a ram caught in the bush. Do you think that ram just materialized? <clears throat> no. The ram was always there. The ram was maybe guided up there to get stuck in the bush long enough so that Abraham could see it in time. But the ram was always there. Abraham was so fixated on what he believed the assignment was, namely, sacrifice his kid, that he didn't see it until the angel pointed it out. So that's one of the reasons why we need to give thanks to God ahead of the fact is because by looking out and looking up towards God, He then shows us. We don't get so fixated on ourselves and what we think we're supposed to do. It's what I call the four walls thinking, that we're all sort of caught in our four walls and we don't see beyond it. Some people talk about looking for a demon behind every tree. I say if you look for a demon behind every tree, you're going to miss the ram in the bush. And that's the thing that Abraham saw. He saw the ram of the bush when he looked up. And there was a sacrifice, and the kid was saved, and then Isaac shall his seed be called, and all of that. What else do we have? We got Pilate asking, what is truth? And <laughs> who's he looking at? The way, the truth, and the life. It's standing there staring him right in the face. Another good reason to sit down, to kneel down, to pray, to hit the word of God if we are faced with a problem, if we are confused, we don't know how to handle it. What is truth? Get into the truth. Find out what that is by opening the word. And gradually it starts to manifest. I shouldn't say gradually. It might just come to you like that, depending on how God's timetable happens to be. But the fact of the matter is, you face the truth, you allow the truth to work through you, and then you start to see what the truth is. You look up, you see God, you see what he's got going, and you see how he's got the solution to your situation. Gospel mission. I've talked about gospel mission quite a bit. That's, a, that's an example right in the here and now, you know, in, in this physical world, of something where God has provided the solution ahead of the problem. It was established in 1929 before the Great Depression, before that part of Vancouver turned into Skid Row. It was there. It was ready to help people. It moved into bigger quarters in the 40s before the end of the Second World War, before soldiers were demobbed, coming home and, and, and unable to work their way back into society. And so they fell into alcohol. They fell into, they fell into Skid Row. And the mission was there. And when the Lord told us we had to open the showers facility called the Lord's Rain before the end of April 2008, well, we opened it on April 30th, 2008. And what happened two months later? The world economy tanked. People weren't giving anymore. But we were set up and we were open for business and we had a financial cushion that got us through that time, just in time for somebody else to come along and make a big contribution a year later which helped us get beyond the world financial crisis. So you see, God just moves ahead of the curve, and if you can see that, if you can just say, God, you're ahead of the curve, take me there, then he'll move with you. He's provided the solution and says, stand by for the problem. But I've got to tell you one more story from the mission before I, before I get back to scripture here. But a couple of years ago, I was going through the donated clothing, and I came across this set of Stanfield Woolies. Anybody know what I'm talking about when I talk about Stanfield Woolies? I'm talking about single suit, full, it's full body armor against the Canadian winter. That's what it is. Single suit, wool, John, we probably are familiar with the, with the concept at any rate. You know, button up, it's got a little button flap in the rear end as well for outhouse use. And it just a one single piece thing, heavy wool. I look at that, I'm like, wow. I wonder who's going to need that around here in Vancouver. 
Well, I got my answer two days later. This woman came in. She spent the night out on the street. She was cold, she was wet, she was tired. She couldn't sleep. She lay down on one of our benches, tried to sleep, but she couldn't because she was shivering so much. And I remembered the Stanfields. And I got them and I wrapped her in them. And she went to sleep and slept through the rest of that time she was there. I haven't seen her since, by the way. But uh, you see, there once again, God provided the solution. And then the problem came up. So this is what we need to keep in mind. This is why we thank God ahead of the fact before he's done something. Because the fact of the matter is, he has already done something. We just got to look for it, and we start finding it by saying thank you. You don't have to look very hard. You don't have to cudge with your brains and go, oh, hey, what a problem. What am I going to do? What's the solution? No, God's going to give you that solution once you just shut up and say thank you. And then he comes through for you. Then he comes through with that. So what happened with the loaves and fish? How was it that Jesus was able to thank God and then feed all these people? You ever stop to wonder why out of upwards of 7,000 people, only one person, a little kid, brought food? You know? I mean, it's not recorded that anybody else came up there with a bag of food at that point and said, here, you can take mine as well. Nor is it recorded that anybody said, no thanks, I'm good, when they passed around the bread and fish. But there was this little boy who was positioned. This is God at work here, beautifully. He was positioned so that he could overhear the conversation. He was obviously close enough that he heard them talking about where we're going to get food. And he has this childlike innocence, the very quality that we all need if we're going to come to the kingdom of heaven as a child to come forward and say, I got this. Will this help? He had the faith to know that Jesus' ability to provide for the people there was greater than his fear of going hungry. And he handed it over. And of course, Andrew, being a mature adult, was, <laughs> what is this among so many? You know. But Jesus knows exactly what to do with it because there, manifesting, is the tip of the iceberg. This little teeny tiny bit, five loaves and two fishes. And Jesus takes that because he knows that God's provision is all that 95, 8, hundred percent of the of, of, of the iceberg that's below the surface that he can't see. And he takes that and he says, thank you. And then he starts passing out. Passing out the fish and the bread to everybody. Everybody eats and there's enough left over for, for a casserole the next day. I mean, you know, he, he, he just keeps handing that out because he took it and said thank you to God. So that's where that solution was provided. You never know where it's going to come from. It may not look like much of a solution. But if you give it to God and you say thank you before he's done anything or before what he has done becomes manifest, then you start to see his glory. And it becomes greater than anyone could have asked or thought. I mean, if it was even in man's economy, it would have taken that bread and fish and it would have been just enough for everybody. Amen? But instead, there were leftovers. Yeah. Everybody got fed, everybody had as much as they wanted, and there were baskets and baskets full of breadcrumbs and fish fragments, which they gathered up afterwards. So you see, God doesn't just provide enough. He goes over the top. God is not, you know, his grace may be sufficient, but his provision goes beyond that. Paul says, exceedingly, abundantly more than we could ever ask or think. And time and time again, and you can probably look at it in your own life, where you've given something to God, and he has come through big time. I did that 10 years ago. I have to remind myself that now, because the blessings he has heaped on me in those 10 years since, since I had that back-to-the-wall experience have just been beyond anything I could have thought of. And it's the same thing for anybody else. And if you start looking back over your own history, I'll bet you're going to find it too. And it's times like that to remind yourself of what he has done and where he's going to take you. Not just what you read in scripture, but what's happened in your own life. Paul says in Philippians, he writes, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your prayers, yet let your requests be known to God. The antidote to anxiety is giving thanks. You're worried about something? Thank God. Because the only thing we have to worry about is being worried. 
The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. You just give thanks to God and He will take it from there. We just took communion. And that's one of the biggest examples. In fact, probably the, what am I saying? Probably. It is the biggest example of God providing a solution ahead of a problem. Because every one of us here was born into sin. Every one of us here was born a sinner and separated from God because of that. Jesus went to the cross, shed his blood that washes away our sins. He did that 2,000 years ago. It's no new revelation to us. This is not something God just happened to do yesterday. It happened 2,000 years ago. The solution is right there, staring us in the face. You come to Jesus, you receive his blood, you receive his sacrifice for us, and our problem of having been in sin is erased. Paul says, while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. You know what that means? Because he put it in the past tense. It means we ain't sinners anymore when we come under the blood. Amen? So if the, so the problem was there, the solution was there even longer. And when we receive that, and we thank God for that, and we thank Jesus for being obedient, and we thank God for his love and for sacrificing his son for us, then we have the greatest solution of them all. And there is nothing that can stop us. It's what Paul refers to as being more than conquerors. What can be more than a conqueror? Think about it. Actually, it's not something we can think about because I think that's something that's way too big for us to even, even contemplate. But that's what God wants for us. And it starts with us taking the loaves and fishes in our lives and saying, here you go, God. Thank you. Whatever it is, thank you. Whatever it is, it's going to be glorious. Whatever it is, it's more than I could have expected. So lay it on me. You guys get anything out of this today? Yeah. Praise God. Let's, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you. Amen. Go with God all this week, maybe.